In this video, I'm going to apply Gauss's law, which is one of Maxwell's equations, to a point charge. And then we're going to see that that's actually very closely linked to Coulomb's law. And this is all concerned with electrostatics. And electrostatics is an area in electromagnetism, right? It's a special case where all the charges and all the electric fields are stationary and they don't change with respect to time. Let's have a look at this situation over here. So what do we have in this diagram? Well, I've written uh, capital Q to denote a point charge. And this point charge, capital Q, sits in space. And for, for now, I want you to ignore this test charge, little q. That's gonna, we're going to use that in a second, but we'll just ignore that for now. Right now, we have a vacuum. There's nothing else in space. There is just this one point charge denoted by capital Q. This could be positive, could be negative. Let's take the convention that this is positive. So that means that electric fields uh, or electric field lines are going to emanate from that point. And they're actually going to pass through every possible spherical surface that we can draw around it. Why do we want to draw a spherical surface? Well, because this problem has got spherical symmetry. There is spherical symmetry inherent in this problem, so we're going to use a spherical surface. Down here, I've written Gauss's law in integral form. So the surface integral of the electric field is equal to 1 over epsilon naught times this volume integral of the charge density. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply this integral form of Gauss's law to this point charge, and then we're going to derive some expressions about the electric field. First of all, let's look at what's going to happen to the right-hand side of this equation, because that's the simple side of this equation. This volume integral of the charge density, uh, its aim is to compute all of the charge that is within a volume. So we're choosing a volume V that is a spherical volume that is bounded by a surface S. And that surface S is a sphere. So that's the S that shows up here. That's the boundary for this guy. This surface S is the boundary surface for this volume V. So what is this going to be? What is this integral going to evaluate to? Well, if you remember from some of the previous videos in this playlist, this volume integral is the total charge in the volume. What's the total charge in this volume? What's the total charge in this sphere? Well, it's going to be Q. So Q is the right-hand side of this equation. And Q divided by epsilon naught, because epsilon naught is this constant we have to divide by to make the units work out, and also to make them equivalent. We want the left-hand side and the right-hand side to be equivalent. Uh, now let's have a look at the left-hand side of the, the equation. We have to do this surface integral. Now, you may think, OK, it's pretty hard to do a surface integral. We have to parameterize the surface with two variables. We have to go through all these procedures. But remember, this has spherical symmetry. And this has spherical symmetry, which means that at every point along the surface of the sphere, every point on this sphere, the electric field is going to be parallel to the normal vector. So the normal vector points perpendicular to the surface of the sphere at every point on the sphere. And so does the electric field. So their dot product is just going to be the same as the magnitude of the electric field. What is the magnitude of the electric field? Well, it turns out that doesn't vary either. It's constant at every point on the surface. Why is it constant? Because at every point on the surface, we're at distance r away from the center. That's a property of spheres. Again, spherical symmetry is very convenient. So at every single point on this green sphere, which is sitting in 3D space, at every single point, the electric field magnitude is exactly the same. So we can write that as the electric field magnitude evaluated at the radial distance r. And this can be at any radius, right? We're choosing any radius r. This is an arbitrary radius. So the electric field evaluated at uh, the value r. And r is the radial distance. That's what we're actually trying to solve for. We're trying to find an expression for the electric field. That's what Gauss's law is very useful for. It's, it's good for finding the electric field. So the surface integral is going to be the product of the electric field evaluated at that value r multiplied by the surface area of the sphere. And the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So 4 pi r squared is the surface area of any sphere if the radius is r. This is the same r. This is the radial distance away from the center. So q sits over here, and a distance r away from q, that is where the surface of the sphere is. So that's the left-hand side 
which is the surface integral, and this is the right-hand side, which is this volume integral, the charge density. So now we have this equivalence. We have the surface integral is equivalent to this charge divided by epsilon naught. So let's do some rearranging. We can do some rearranging. We can divide both sides by 4 pi r squared, and that's going to give us this. Keep in mind, all of this is in terms of the magnitude of the electric field we have to add in some directionality because the electric field is a vector quantity. So how do we add in uh, this magnitude uh, or this direction to the magnitude? Well, we look at this unit ve vector r hat. And r hat is the unit vector in the radial direction. Right? So let's have a look at how you can actually get this directionality. So have a look at this spherical symmetry. The spherical symmetry says that everything is going to be in the radial direction. So the magnitude is going to be the same for every uh, sphere or every spherical surface at every uh, radial distance away from the center. So the only thing that determines your magnitude is your radial distance, nothing else. It doesn't matter at which angle you're at. The only thing that matters is how far away you are from this point charge. Then we just have to incorporate the radial uh, vector r hat. And this guy is the unit vector in the radial direction. So you can write this in a different coordinate system, like a Cartesian or a cylindrical coordinate system, but it won't be as convenient. Right? It's not as convenient to go x, y, z as it is to have this r hat. Because in this coordinate system, in the spherical coordinate system, theta and phi, which are the other two angles that you need to describe the location in three dimensions, they actually don't matter. There's no dependence on the angle. There's only a dependence on the radial distance from that point charge Q. So this over here is the electric field due to a point charge. So this is one of the most important things in electrostatics. Because you can use the superposition principle, and you can add these guys together. If you have two point charges, you just take the electric field due to one, and then you take the electric field due to another. And that gives you the overall electric field, which is just the superposition of those two electric fields. So in, in that kind of scenario, it may actually be more useful to use Cartesian coordinates. So you can replace this r squared with maybe a x squared plus y squared. In some situations, maybe cylindrical coordinates may have a uh, slight advantage and simplify your problem. But in this simple example where it's just one guy, one point charge, this works. This also works for other examples where you have spherical symmetry. This doesn't have to be a point charge. It could be a spherical object with an even, a homogeneous uh, charge distribution on the surface. It could be a metal ball with an even distribution of charge on the outside. So that would also fit inside here, and it would have the exact same effect. As long as there's an equal amount of charge on the inside, as long as this surface encloses an equal amount of charge, well, you're going to have the same electric field. So the electric field uh, has a dependence that is 1 on r squared. This is the inverse square law. This holds for a lot of phenomena in physics, including Newtonian gravitation. So the inverse square law pops up in a lot of different scenarios. Why does it pop up? Well, in this derivation, it actually popped up from when we did the surface integral, because there's a dependence of 4 pi r squared. And that is the surface area of a uh, sphere. If you think about it, the further away you are, the influence of that charge is spread out over a larger and larger surface. And that surface grows at, with the square of r. As you increase r, the surface grows with r squared. And so all of the influence of that charge in three-dimensional space has to be spread out over larger and larger chunks. So that means the electric field strength is going to fall with a 1 over r squared relationship. So that's the inverse square law. Now let's have a look at what would happen if we introduced a tiny charge Q. Now this is called a test charge. So imagine we took this tiny little charge Q, this is a lowercase Q to distinguish it from this capital Q, and we brought it to some distance away from Q. What would be the force experienced by this test, test charge? Well, that's where Coulomb's law comes in. Coulomb's law says that the magnitude of the electrostatic force, that's Fe, the magnitude of this electrostatic force, is going to be this constant out here, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which appears here as well, times the product of these two charges divided by the radial distance squared. Now, can we see that this is actually very similar to this? What's the only thing that's missing? 
Well, it's this little Q. That's because electric field, that is defined as the force per unit charge. And this is just the force. So you have to add in that charge. So this is the force per unit charge, and this is just the force. So this product of the two forces actually will determine the direction as well. Because if both are positively charged, the repulsive force will, will, uh, will result. But there will actually be an attractive force if one is positive and one is negative. So the opposites will attract, and the same charges will repel each other. If this was positive and this was positive, they would repel each other. If this was negative and this was a negative, they would repel each other. And if one was positive and the other one was negative, there would be an attractive force. So this over here tells you electrostatic repulsion or attraction depending on the signs of these guys. Another way you can actually write Coulomb's law is with this constant over here. So this guy is actually exactly the same as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And that's called Coulomb's constant. So this is Coulomb's law, and that's Coulomb's constant. So I'll give you a little summary of what we covered in this video. What we did was we applied Gauss's law, which is the first of Maxwell's equations, to a point charge. We used these integral concepts and some spherical symmetry to deduce the surface integral and the volume integral. Then, when we found the surface integral of the electric field, we found it to be the magnitude of the electric field evaluated at a radial distance r times 4 pi r squared. And when we evaluated this volume integral and multiplied it by the constant out the front, we found it to be capital Q, which is this charge in the center, divided by epsilon naught. Then we divided both sides by 4 pi r squared, and we got this expression for the magnitude of the electric field. Then we introduced directionality by introducing the unit vector r hat. And that tells us that the electric field is always going to point in the radial direction. And finally, we linked this electric field example over here to Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's law is one of those fundamental laws in electrostatics that helps you figure out what's going to happen with two charges. But keep in mind that Coulomb's law only works if those charges are static, if it's a statics problem. The moment you start moving charges along, then you have to introduce more of Maxwell's equations, and you have to start talking about magnetism as well. So things can get way more complicated, but remember, this is the building blocks of electrostatics. You can use this to build uh, any kind of charge distribution where you have multiple point charges. Why can you do that? Well, it's because of the superposition principle. The superposition principle allows you to take the electric fields of many point charges to combine them together, and the overall electric field is just going to be the sum. So that was Gauss's law applied on a single point charge, and then we linked it to Coulomb's law, one of the fundamental laws of electrostatics.